Please welcome Deputy Secretary of the United States Department of Agriculture, Sochil Torres Small. Good afternoon. It is a privilege to be here with each and every one of you. With our steps, we remember the horror of Bloody Sunday, the horror of much of our history, and the inequities that persist today. But as we mourn, as we follow the footsteps of the foot soldiers, we are reminded that we can find beauty in the ashes, that amid the spirit of heaviness, we can put on the garment of praise. It calls to mind a duty to live a life worthy, to live a life worthy that even 59 years as the struggle continues, we must do more. When I think of that struggle, I think of Congressman John Lewis, who I had the privilege to serve with for two short years. I was in awe of him, that a giant of the civil rights movement could humbly and gently lead newbies like me with love and compassion. He taught me that you could be powerful in your march for justice, while at the same time, to walk humbly with love. As the Deputy Secretary for the United States Department of Agriculture, I get to work with Secretary Vilsack and 100,000 people at USDA who know that we must serve more justly, that we must take an honest look at our past, and through the work of the Equity Commission, through the prompting of President Biden and Vice President Harris, we are doing that. We're doing that for the grandkids of the foot soldiers. We're doing that for grandparents like mine who immigrated from Mexico to pick cotton. We are doing that for all of us. Thank you. Please welcome former Alabama State Senator and co-founder of the Selma Bridge Crossing Jubilee, Hank Sanders. Madam Vice President, Attorney General Garland, noted leaders, foot soldiers, my brothers and sisters, thank you for returning to the bridge. For democracy and the vote are truly at stake. I want to specially acknowledge all who make the bridge crossing jubilee the largest annual gathering for those who love democracy, value the vote, and fight for civil and human rights. I want to lift the invaluable leadership of my dear wife, Faya Rose Ture, who is the president and national coordinator, volunteer national coordinator of the Jubilee. And I want to thank Dr. James Mitchell who is president of the Selma and Montgomery Marge Foundation. All who work with the Jubilee truly understand the theme, return 
to the bridge, democracy and the vote at stake. We have braved an insurrection and we see widespread attacks on institutions and election officials. We see hundreds of bills to limit voting. We see book burnings and book bannings. We see the rise of a strong movement for dictatorship. We see the insurrection continuing in so many ways. But over the last 200 years, we have fought too hard to be included in this imperfect democracy to allow it to be demolished or diminished. I am most thankful for President Joe Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris. They have done more than any presidential team since the 1960s. They are doing <coughs> all in their power to stem this terrible tide of insurrection. But the tide is too strong for our leaders to stand alone in the gap. Every one of us must stand in the gap and fight and sacrifice. There's an enduring spirit here in Selma. It was forged in the heat of battle by foot soldiers and others too numerous to name. A measure of that spirit was forged right here on this bridge, named after Edmund Pettus, a Confederate officer and grand dragon of the Alabama Ku Klux Klan. The spirit of the bridge was transformed by the blood and suffering of those brutally beaten on it while fighting for democracy and the vote. The forces against democracy continue together. They are many and they are powerful. But the spirit for it here is greater. We remember that in the struggle for the right to vote, one side had everything. All the laws and lawmakers, all the police and lawmen, all the banks and money, all of the business and jobs, all the guns and gunmen, all the voters and voters, all of the office and office holders, all the everything. And the other side had almost nothing. Yet those with almost nothing took marching feet and singing songs and praying prayer and forged great victories. That is the spirit we connect with when we return to the bridge, for we must forge new victories. Return to the bridge and save democracy and the vote. Return to the bridge and save democracy and the vote. Return to the bridge and save democracy and the vote. Please welcome President and CEO of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, Charles Still Jr. Let the church say amen. amen. My brothers and sisters, I'm so glad to be with you today. But it's one thing that we must realize. You have to be courageous in order to bring about a change. And I'm not just talking about the leaders. 
we as African Americans and poor people have really gone through a lot. And there are some folks who want to deny us our history. But it was America, and America is guilty. It was the transatlantic African slave trade. And you're going to tell me you don't want to talk about slavery? We want access to capital. We don't have no money. I was in Atlanta the other day and right on Auburn Avenue where we had two or three people, and I know they were mentally ill from drugs, but they all around us walking around butt naked. But there's a system within America that claim and act like racism is not alive. Racism is a virus. And what I want to thank God for to give me the courage to talk about it. I don't fool with no scared folks. Because a scared Negro gets you killed. You don't hear me, church. You can't be scared and out here ceremoniously talking about you love the Lord and you fight for justice. If you're scared, get out of the way. We got to fight for this thing called freedom. Dr. Key said freedom has always been an expensive thing. It calls to be free. You give your life. We need money. You have to give to the movement. I know I'm going to hear the music playing after a while. They're going to say he's sad enough. But as I go to my seat, Spivey, I'm here to let you know that we just getting started. Dr. King talked about America and the other America. We are the other America. Well, folks don't care about us. You can't even get a loan at the bank. They call on an underwriter. Somebody you never met before and never would meet. You can't build no relationships. The diameter of your mind is determined by the circumference of your environment. Woo! Hello, somebody. Talk to me, church. What is it saying? You have to change your friends sometimes. Sometimes you're around the wrong folks. They don't want you to be in the movement. They don't want you to be successful. And all I'm saying as I go to my seat, Rodney King said, Rodney King said, why we can't just get along? We need affordable housing. People can't afford rent. Folks can't buy groceries. Dr. King said, silence in the face of evil is evil itself. Say something. Somebody ought to say something. Fired up. Fired up. I'm fired up. Fired up. They ain't going to take it no more. Please welcome Deputy Secretary of the United States Department of Veterans Affairs, Tanya Bratcher. Good afternoon. Any veterans here? Huh? Fabulous. Wonderful. It is an honor to be here with Vice President Harris and so many other distinguished guests. As the Deputy Secretary of the VA and a fourth generation black veteran, I want to take a minute to reflect on today's March means to our nation and to the veterans whose service and sacrifice enables the very existence of our country. The march was about righting the wrongs of our shared past it was about exercising the freedoms veterans bled to defend. And today, President Biden, Vice President Harris, and this administration continues that fight for all Americans. For too long, too many Americans have fought too hard 
around the globe to protect our rights and freedoms, and then fought brutal battles here at home for their own rights and freedoms. Americans like James Armstrong, a World War II Army veteran, he carried the American flag at the head of the march across the bridge. His body was beaten, bruised, bloodied, and he fell to his knees. But his spirit stayed strong. He never let that flag hit the ground. And every anniversary of this march, he continued to carry the American flag. Mr. Armstrong passed away 15 years ago, but I still feel his spirit with us today still carrying that flag alongside all of us, never letting it drop. At VA and in this administration, we're going to always serve veterans, like Mr. Armstrong, every bit as well as he's served us. And we're going to keep marching together until we're standing tall, until our feet are firmly planted on the other side of that bridge. Thank you. May God bless all of you, our veterans, their families, caregivers, and survivors, and may he continue to bless this great nation. Please welcome Secretary of the United States Department of Education, Miguel Cardona. Good afternoon. What an honor it is to join our Vice President, my cabinet colleagues, the Beemans, Alexis, LaWanda, Jordan, and our many distinguished guests here today. We're here to commemorate that day 59 years ago on this bridge, Bloody Sunday, a day that shocked the conscience of our nation in the brutality and racism it laid bare and drove our leaders to action to protect voting rights. But we also remember the legacy of Bloody Sunday isn't just about one moment in history, but how it still moves us, appalls us, drives us to keep fighting for change. The late great Congressman John Lewis, who co-led this march when he was only 25 years old, the one who I'm reminded of every day when I see my bracelet that reminds me to get into good trouble, he would often say, try to be a pilot light and not a firecracker. Firecrackers go off in a flash, he once wrote. A pilot light burns steady, and it burns forever. The fact that we're here today, 59 years after Bloody Sunday, led by our first black Vice President, Kamala Harris. Let's give it up for Vice President Harris. It's a reflection of how this nation has kept that pilot light for justice burning. So to draw inspiration from Congressman Lewis and to honor all those who marched 59 years ago, let us resolve to keep that light burning steadily, burning forever. Let us keep that light burning as we face down the most powerful people who embrace racism and revisionist history by banning black books and African-American history let us keep that light burning as we take on the stubborn legacies of segregation that still persist, from the effects of redlining in our housing to the challenges our black business owners face. And let us keep that light burning as we strive to build a better nation for the generations to come, whether it's lifting up our nation's HBCUs or unapologetically fixing a broken education system that has normalized failure for too many black and brown students. 59 years from now, when future leaders stand in this very spot, may they see and feel that light still burning. 59 years from now, may they say we never let the light fade in our quest for a nation of greater dignity, stronger democracy for all, and a more perfect union and may they be inspired to do the same. Thank you. Thank you.
Please welcome Secretary of the United States Department of Housing and Urban Development, Marsha Fudge. Listen, y'all see when I came, the sun came out. I just want you to know. Thank you for the sunshine. Uh, you know, Terry, I was talking to my soon-to-be 93-year-old mother the other day, and I said to her that the vice president wanted me to come with her to Selma. And I said, well, I'm not sure that I really want to do that. And she said, why can't you? My question to you today is, why can't we? Why can't we? come together and fight and support the people who fight for us and support us every day. Why can't we? You know, why can't we come together and demand decent and affordable housing and good schools and safe neighborhoods and fair wages? Why can't we hold America to its promise? Why can't we fight for equality, for fairness, for justice and freedom? Let us finish what they started 59 years ago on this bridge. Let's not leave it for the people who follow us. Let's finish it. Please welcome United States Representative Terry Sewell. Welcome to Alabama's 7th Congressional District, and more specifically, welcome to my hometown of Selma, Alabama. What a glorious day it is to welcome my dear friend and colleague, the Vice President of these United States, Kamala Harris, back to Selma. I want to begin by acknowledging my colleagues in Congress who have joined us today. If you are a member of Congress, can you please stand? We have with us Senator Butler, CBC Chair Stephen Horsford, Congressman Joe Morelli, Congresswoman Nikema Williams, Congresswoman Melanie Stansbury. I also want to welcome the officials from the Biden-Harris administration who are here. Secretary of State Cardona, HUD Secretary Marsha Fudge, Attorney General Merrick Garland, and Assistant Attorney General Kirsten Clark, welcome all to Selma, Alabama. Now, as we join together on this historic Edmund Pettus Bridge for the 59th commemoration, I am reminded of how far we have come in just one year here in Selma after being devastated by an E-43 tornado on January 12th, 2023. We have made good progress, and I want to specifically thank Vice President Harris and the entire Biden administration for their commitment to helping Selma, Alabama recover. We are so grateful for their immediate and decisive action in approving a disaster declaration and granting our request for 100% federal costs to fully reimburse the debris removal. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I also want to thank all of the cabinet secretaries for having a whole of government approach to helping Selma recover. And they've started, they've started with HUD. I don't know where Marsha Fudge is, but Marsha, we love you. <laughs> we in Alabama's 7th Congressional District are a resilient people. After all, it was the people of this district who dared to make this nation live up to its highest ideals of equality and justice for all. It was their sacrifice of the people of this district, this hometown of mine, 
that brought us the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965. I come from great stock. But today we see that the legacy is under attack. Everywhere we look, old battles have become new again as extremists work to erase our history, silence our voices, and roll back our hard-fought freedoms. Nowhere is that more evident than at the ballot box. Never did I think that the cause for which those freedom riders and those foot soldiers had would become our cause too. 59 years later, they were bludgeoned on a bridge in 1965 for the equal right of all Americans to vote. And the fact that 59 years later it's in peril means that we got work to do. We have work to do. Never did I think that the cause for which they, which John Lewis and those brave foot soldiers marched and bled and even died would become our cause too. But as we have learned from our foremothers and forefathers, progress is elusive. And it is up to every generation to preserve the progress of the past and to advance it. It was John Lewis who said, ours is not the struggle of one day, one week, or one year. Ours is not the struggle of one judicial appointment or one presidential term. Ours is the struggle of a lifetime or many lifetimes. And each of us in every generation must do our part. Ladies and gentlemen, we have to do our part. I proudly carry the seminal piece of legislation that bears Congressman John Lewis's name that would fully restore the protections of the VRA. It's called the John Robert Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act, and we need to pass it now. It needs to be signed into law now. When do we need it? We need it now. We all have a role to play. As leaders, we must lead, and as voters, we must vote. I submit to you this. If your vote didn't matter, extremists wouldn't be trying so hard to take it away. Our vote is our voice, and when we vote, we win. And when black people vote, we make a difference. Look at Atlanta, Nakima. Let me say it again. When we vote, we all win. Uplifting underserved communities and black communities is uplifting all of America. So we can make a difference, but we must act. There is no better way to honor the legacy of those whose shoulders we stand on than to exercise the right that they sought for us to secure. In the words of John Lewis, the vote is the most sacred nonviolent tool in our democracy, and we must use it or we lose it. Today, we cross the Edmund Pettus Bridge in honor of their legacy, but our march towards the beloved community does not end on the other side. It continues in every vote that's cast, every vote that's counted, and in every voice that is heard. When I close my eyes, I can still remember jo John Lewis's final words. John, riddled with cancer, came on that bridge four months before he passed to walk across that bridge, as he would say, one more time. He gave us the solution and the remedy if you close your eyes, I think you could almost hear him. He said, never give up, never give in, work as hard as you can, and keep your eyes on the prize. We are not going to give up. We are not going to give in. And we are not going back. So we're going to pass the John Robert Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act I will continue every Congress that I am so proud to be elected. I will continue to make sure that we introduce and we pass the John Robert Lewis Voting Rights Act. All of these Congress people come to Selma, Republicans and Democrats, don't just come to Selma. Honor John's legacy and the legacies of the foot soldiers and do something about it.
We can do it, and we can do it together. Please welcome Spelman University student and youth member of the Selma Jubilee, Azalee Fortier. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the annual Bridge Crossing Jubilee. If you have come a ways to be here, I commend you for your efforts in coming. And if you are from here, I ask you to enjoy the learning experience that is the Jubilee. My name is Azali Fortier, and I am a 16-year-old first-year English major at Spelman College. <laughs> and today, I would like to introduce someone incredibly special. This woman is someone who serves as an extraordinary role model. Many young girls such as myself have come to adore. She is a woman of many accomplishments and responsibilities. And through the journey of her career, she has exhibited her ability to bring and create change. Vice President Harris continues to lead on addressing the academic of gun violence while overseeing the first ever White House of gun violence prevention. Not only this, but she has continued the fight for civil rights by launching the Reproductive Freedom Tour. Her efforts and vision has provided young women like me who aspire to create impactful, long-lasting change, an example of black excellence. But before I introduce this wondrous woman, allow me to give due credit to those who have made this possible. Ladies, gentlemen, and those in between, you are in the city of Selma. This is a historic place that many change makers have come to during the vision of many of the great opportunities we as a country experience today. Leaders like Bernard Lafayette, James Bevel, Amelia Boynton, Marie Foster, Martin Luther King Jr., the Foot Soldiers, the Radical Youth, and many others. These leaders and foot soldiers have made strides towards the betterment of the world, and they forever have my gratitude. But please do not mistake a thank you as an adequate show of gratitude. Gratitude requires action. Take advantage of your position. Learn about their efforts. Teach about their efforts. Keep their stories alive. Pave the way for change. Vice President Harris has done this, not only for the people of today, but for the people of tomorrow. <laughs> she is, in the words of Maya Angelou, the hopes and dreams of the slave. Kamala Harris was the first person of color to be elected into the position of District Attorney of San Francisco. She is the hopes and dreams of the slave. Kamala Harris was the first black woman to become the attorney general for the state of California. She is the hopes and dreams of the slave. She has held the position of the U.S. Senator. She is the hopes and dreams of the slave. And she has served as a model for young women like me to let us know we are the hopes and the dreams of the slave. Look at where you are and know that we are the products of the hopes and dreams of the slave. Make use of their efforts and suffering. Learn of it. Teach of it. Keep their stories alive. Follow the example of Vice President Harris and take it one step further. Become the hopes and dreams of the slave realized. Ladies, gentlemen, and all those in between, 
I have the honor to introduce the first woman and the first black woman to be the vice president of the United States. Give it up for Kamala Harris, y'all. and dreams are alive and well. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Please have a seat. I'll tell you, when I listen to Ozzy, I know the future of our country is bright. So it is so good to be back in Selma, and I want to say on behalf of the second gentleman and me, it is a privilege to be with so many extraordinary leaders, members of Congress, members of our administration, dedicated activists, and dear friends. So before I begin today, I must address the humanitarian crisis in Gaza. What we are seeing every day in Gaza is devastating. We have seen reports of families eating leaves or animal feed women giving birth to malnourished babies with little or no medical care, and children dying from malnutrition and dehydration. As I have said many times, too many innocent Palestinians have been killed. And just a few days ago, we saw hungry, desperate people approach aid trucks, simply trying to secure food for their families after weeks of nearly no aid reaching northern Gaza. And they were met with gunfire and chaos. Our hearts break for the victims of that horrific tragedy and for all the innocent people in Gaza who are suffering from what is clearly a humanitarian catastrophe. People in Gaza are starving. The conditions are inhumane. And our common humanity compels us to act. As President Joe Biden said on Friday, the United States is committed to urgently get more life-saving assistance to innocent Palestinians in need. Yesterday, the Department of Defense carried out its first airdrop of humanitarian assistance, and the United States will continue these airdrops. And we will work on a new route by sea to deliver aid. And the Israeli government must do more to significantly increase the flow of aid. No excuses. They must open new border crossings. They must not impose any unnecessary restrictions on the delivery of aid. They must ensure humanitarian personnel, sites, and convoys are not targeted. And they must work to restore basic services and promote order in Gaza so more food, water, and fuel can reach those in need. As I have said repeatedly since October 7, Israel has a right to defend itself. And President Joe Biden and I are unwavering in our commitment to Israel's security. Hamas cannot control Gaza. And the threat Hamas poses to the people of Israel must be eliminated. Hamas is a brutal 
terrorist organization that has vowed to repeat October 7th again and again until Israel is annihilated. Hamas has shown no regard for innocent life, including for the people of Gaza, who have suffered under its rule for almost two decades. And Hamas still holds dozens of hostages for nearly 150 days now. Innocent men and women, including American citizens, who were brutally taken from their homes and from a concert. I will repeat, the threat of Hamas poses to the people of Israel must be eliminated. And given the immense scale of suffering in Gaza, there must be an immediate ceasefire. For at least the next six weeks, which is what is currently on the table. This will get the hostages out and get a significant amount of aid in. This would allow us to build something more enduring to ensure Israel is secure and to respect the right of the Palestinian people to dignity, freedom, and self-determination. Hamas claims it wants a ceasefire. Well, there is a deal on the table. And as we have said, Hamas needs to agree to that deal. Let's get a ceasefire. Let's reunite the hostages with their families. And let's provide immediate relief to the people of Gaza. I will now address the occasion for our gathering today on this hallowed ground on the foot of the Edmund Pettus Bridge, where 59 years ago, on a cold Sunday morning, 600 brave souls set out from Selma, hand in hand, shoulder to shoulder, they marched for the freedoms that were theirs by birth and theirs by right. The freedom to vote, the freedom to live without fear of violence or intimidation, the freedom to be full and equal members of our nation. They marched peacefully. They knew violence against them was inevitable. They knew they would be surrounded by troopers with nightsticks. They knew they might be trampled by horses. Even so, they marched forward. But they were forced to retreat. And yet, they would not be deterred, defeated, or denied. And they returned to this bridge while many were still bound in bandages because they knew what was on the other side. A promise of a future that was more equal, more just, and more free. And yes, they crossed this bridge. And in so doing, they also built a bridge. They brought together white Americans, black Americans, all sorts of Americans, and ministers, and rabbis, and members of SCLC, and SNCC, and folks of all ages and backgrounds. And less than six months later, the Voting Rights Act of 1964 was signed into law. The story of Selma, a story of our nation. Freedom is fundamental to the promise of America. Freedom is not to be given. It is not to be bestowed. It is ours by right. And the power behind the promise of freedom has always been in the faith of her people and our willingness to fight for freedom, be it on the fields of Gettysburg, in the schools of Little Rock, on the streets of Ferguson, and on this bridge right here in Selma. And today we know our fight for freedom is not over. 
because in this moment we are witnessing a full-on attack on hard-fought, hard-won freedoms, starting with the freedom that unlocks all others, the freedom to vote, the sacred freedom to vote. Today, in states across our nation, extremists pass laws to ban drop boxes, limit early voting, and restrict absentee ballots. In Georgia, extremists passed a law to even make it illegal to give people food and water for standing in line to exercise their civic duty and right to vote. I ask the friends here, Rev, whatever happened to love thy neighbor? The hypocrisy abounds. And do notice, the governor of Georgia signed that law on the 56th anniversary of this very march. Across our nation, extremists attacked the integrity of free and fair elections, causing a rise of threats and violence against poll workers. In the face of these assaults on the freedom to vote, and in honor of all those who crossed this bridge, President Biden and I will continue to demand that the United States Congress pass the Freedom to Vote Act and the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act. The fight for freedom. Today in states across our nation, extremists propose and pass laws that attack the freedom of a woman to make decisions about her own body. Laws that would make no exception even for rape or incest. Here in Alabama, they attack the freedom to use IVF treatment. Women and couples denied the ability to fulfill their dream of having a child. And consider the irony. On the one hand, these extremists tell women they do not have the freedom to end an unwanted pregnancy. And on the other hand, these extremists tell women they do not have the freedom to start a family. Let us agree. One does not have to abandon their faith or deeply held beliefs to agree the government should not be telling her what to do with her body. The fight for freedom, that every person in our nation has a right to be free from the horror of gun violence. And yet today, these extremists stand by and refuse to pass reasonable gun safety laws to keep our children and places of worship safe. Freedom that every person in our nation has a right to be free to love who they love openly and with pride. And yet, just this past year, extremists have passed or proposed hundreds of laws targeting LGBTQ people. Freedom, that every person in our nation has the freedom to learn and acknowledge our country's true and full history. And yet today, extremists pass book bans, book bans in this year of our Lord, 2024. While they also try to erase, overlook, and rewrite the ugly parts of our past. Fundamental freedoms under assault. The freedom to vote, the freedom from fear, violence, and harm, the freedom to learn, the freedom to control one's own body, and the freedom to just simply be. And understand the profound impact these attacks have on the next generation of our leaders. Just last fall, 15,000 young leaders joined me during my fight for our Freedoms College Tour. And for them, these attacks on freedom are a lived experience. It is their lived experience that extremist leaders have intentionally closed polling places near college campuses and restricted the use of student IDs to vote. 
that it is black voters and student voters who are most targeted by anti-voter laws. A lived experience that during the height of their reproductive years, the highest court in our land, the court of Thurgood, and RBG took a constitutional right that had been recognized from the people of America, from the women of America. So that now this generation has fewer rights than their mothers and grandmothers. Their lived experience that from kindergarten to 12th grade, they have consistently had to endure active shooter drills while extremists refuse to pass universal background checks, red flag laws, and an assault weapons ban. Our young leaders, well, they are clear-eyed about what's at stake. And in the spirit of a young John Lewis, I know they too will not be deterred, they will not be defeated, and they will not be denied. So Selma, the challenges we currently face are not unlike the challenges faced by those 600 brave souls 59 years ago. And in this moment, we too then are confronted with a fundamental question. What kind of country do we want to live in? Do we want to live in a country of freedom, liberty, and justice? or a country of injustice, hate, and fear. We each have the power to answer that question. With our voice, with our feet, and with our vote. I'll close by sharing with you in my West Wing office in the White House. Yeah, that's where I work. I hung a piece of this artwork that is the first thing I see when I walk into my office in the morning. It's a large framed photograph taken on Bloody Sunday depicting an injured Amelia Boynton receiving care at the foot of this very bridge. And for me, it is a daily reminder of the struggle, of the sacrifice, and of how much we owe to those who gave so much before us. History is a relay race. Generations before us carried the baton, and now they have passed it to us. So let us continue to organize, let us continue to fight, and let's make some good trouble along the way. God bless you, and God bless the United States of America. Thank you all.